start recording. Come on. Let's see. You call from the office or your place or? Uh, in the office. Cool, cool. Where is the expo office? It's uh, on second admission. Perfect. So <clears throat> right now it's just me and you, right? Right now it is me, you, and about uh, 20 others. But uh, we are optimizing for the, uh, this is going to be recorded and released as a podcast where thousands of people can hear it. So okay. just pretend it's just me and you. All right, sounds good. And then you just drive and I'll answer questions, yep. right? Yep. All right, sounds yep. good. Perfect. Uh, Human, first, welcome to the Product Hunt Podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I, uh, so there's so much I want to get into. Uh, but first, I just want to start with the recent news. You guys just launched uh, an incubator. You were in the New York Times. Uh, why launch an incubator uh, in, you know, right now with so many incubators already out there and everyone you know, launching one? Uh, tell us more about how this yeah, it's a great question. So we have uh, right now at Expa what we call a studio. So there's a couple partners, uh, myself, Garrett Camp, who had founded Uber and Stumble, Naveen, who had founded Foursquare, uh, my other partner, Maloon, who founded Metro Lyrics, and then we have another partner who's kind of running the ship, uh, Roberto. And we would built our studio basically as a platform for us as partners to launch new companies. So we have a couple of new companies out like Operator, Reserve, and what have you. And we thought to ourselves, it would be really amazing to work with new founders, right? Leveraging the capability that we have, the experience that we had, and try to do something a little bit different, right? A little more hands-on, a little more intimate, and let them have access to the capabilities that we've built for ourselves, um, and also a more significant kind of involvement, right? So, you know, I think YC and all these other programs are amazing, um, but I think this is going to be something a little bit different for people who want something a little more intimate, a little more hands-on. What is... Are there certain like spaces or types of companies that you're looking to see, or is it just the best founders you can find? I think right now we're focused on the founders. You know, all of us have been founders, engineers, product people, and for us, it's really about um, really interesting problems and really interesting founders um, that we think we can help. Before that, you know, talk about your sort of journey to Expo. I mean, you were the CEO of Add This. You were sort of doing your own thing in terms of advising and investing in companies. How did you transition uh, to Expo and how did that? So I was, uh, you know, the founder and CEO of Add This for a long time. I was there uh, up through 2012 in an active executive role. And then I transitioned to a chairman role. And it was really great to kind of get on the other side and be a board member. Took some time off. I was really, really tired, man. Um, it was amazing, you know, and I advise everyone to do what I did, just travel, got to see the world, you know. A lot of the things that people don't tell you is when you're starting a, a company, you just give everything into it, right? And you think it's normal, like, I never had gone to a happy hour. I mean, that's an honest fact. I never went to a happy hour, so I was like, what is this happy hour you guys keep talking about? <laughs> so five o'clock, I would actually try that out. But uh, yeah, and it was great because I also got an opportunity to work with other new companies, whether as an investor, an advisor, and, you know, since then, you know, got to invest in great things like Uber and Washio and uh, Convoy and Thrive and, um, you know, companies like Hinge where, you know, Justin is just an amazing founder. I got to spend time with him. And honestly, I learned as much from those guys, probably more, just trying to share with them the knowledge that I had. And then how that translated forward to Expo, I decided, you know, I really enjoyed the East Coast. Uh, I spent a lot of time over there and I thought it'd be great to try to have a new adventure on the West Coast packed up, moved over here, and Garrett and I had known each other for a while. And it started out of me just hanging out because he was very early. Um, him and Naveen were, you know, just starting to put together what Expo would be. And I just, I got hooked and I went from hanging out, saying I'll be an EIR, help out, to just being a partner. And it's a really an awesome way um, for all of us who have built things to continue to build, but then also help other people build uh, via Expo Labs now. After building and selling Add This, which we'll get into later, did you kind of say, hey, you know, I have a success. I'm no longer sort of going to be CEO founder in the same sort of capacity. I want to do more uh, investor advisor type stuff. Is that, is that what happened? So 
I don't know what's going to happen next, honestly. And I think for all of us at Expa, that's part of the reason we're so attracted to it. So on the studio side, um, all the partners build new companies and there are, you know, a lot of times we are the CEOs, right? Like right now, I, we recently launched uh, a company called Ondo, which is in the food delivery space in New York. Um, and, you know, you have to be point when you're launching a new company. And, um, you know, yeah, I'd love to help, you know, we want to put these things together, but at the beginning you need leadership. Sometimes you're lucky, you know, in the case of operator, uh, Garrett, uh, was friends with Robin, uh, Chan, who's done an amazing job building up that company. And he's, he was the clear leader and Garrett could be, you know, a partner to him, um, not as the CEO. Sometimes you have to start it that way. It just really depends. And, um, you know, if I find something amazing where I think I can be the best in class being the CEO, then I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, and I think all the partners support those types of things. Um, it's a very different firm than other firms, right? Because we're not focused on just like shotgunning investments. We're really focused on building. When you were in high school and in college, did you think that you were going to be an entrepreneur? What, what did you think? You know, I grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, and I don't know about the, a lot of the listeners here, but probably didn't grow up in big cities. Uh, I didn't even know about this stuff. And I also, you have to remember, like, I grew up, and my, when I went to school, was right around the dot-com period. So the first time I got exposed to the fact that someone could even do stuff like this was in college. I thought a banker was a person who worked behind a bank teller. You know, I didn't even know what a consultant was. I, all this stuff was foreign to me, man. And uh, when I got to school, I remember there was a presentation, and I always – reference this, but um, Josh Koppelman had just sold half.com um, to eBay. And he was, you know, him and Andy Ratcliffe, who was one of the founders of Benchmark, were talking. And I was like, oh my God, these guys are on stage. They're talking to us. They're telling us we can do these things. And Josh looked like us, right? And so I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Tech people can do stuff. And that was when I got hooked. I knew in college, like right then, that's when I was in. And so right out of college, you went to start what later became at this? Or what was your journey? So there? when I graduated from college, it was uh, the dot com bust. So mm -hmm. there were no jobs. Uh, I ended up going to grad school at Carnegie Mellon, which ended up being an amazing experience, not only from just an education experience, but uh, also the fact that my co-founder for Add This was there. And so we were office mates, man. So we uh, we we both were feeling it. We wanted to build something great. We still believed in the web. It was two thousand two when we went to school, and so we really wanted to do something. And uh, Add This honestly started on on, on a lot of uh, a lot of a dare, so. The arc of your career, what kind of tie, <clears throat> ties the thread together in terms of what you're most interested in and passionate about? So it's a question I ask myself all the time. And what really attracts me at the end of the day are really, really big problems that you can solve through technology. I love software the most, like anything with like web services, software, and anything with scale, you know? I like kind of that equation where it's not just about the technology, but it's how the product is put together and how you craft everything and then how you get that to people in a way that makes sense to them. So, you know, some of the best, I, I was very lucky because we came up in the big social wave. So that's when growth hacking started. You have people like Lance Takuda from Rock U and Max at Slide. And, you know, there's these amazing people that just like K Factor, which is like really common now, was like coming out at that point. People were comparing notes constantly. And um, I'm really interested in things that, where the, where the founders and where I can figure out like a great go to market. And, but there's this big upside at the end of it, right? Not necessarily that the first thing is going to be huge. It's just that there's a clear way for us to enter in, like whether it's an amazing Facebook hack or whether it's like, Hey, there's this cool way to acquire paid users, but it makes sense for our model. So I like growth a ton. I think I'm still figuring out what I'm best at. Uh, from my perspective right now, you know, I was very lucky to be able to learn how to do growth. I mean, we got add this to 2 billion unique users. I got a page rank 10. So I've got to do SEO, SMO, everything else. I enjoy it a lot. But, you know, for me, again, it's, it's kind of that convergence between where um, product and marketing come in. So I love to craft that product, but I love how the go-to-market and the story. So um, I think that. Hey, I'm back. I don't know if you guys even noticed I was gone.
Hey, Eric, I can't hear you. All right, okay. Uh, yeah, you're good. You were just saying how you love the go-to-market uh, story and, and strategy there too. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, that's that's kind of where I like to, to plan because I think product is so critical and everyone at Expa, they're craftsmen at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. Garrett will hit every pixel on, you know, something new and he cares about the brand and Naveen shares that passion. We all have that passion. But for me, it's that intersection because you can build an amazing product, but if you can't figure out a compelling way to get it to the people that need it the most, then right. you don't get to realize that vision. And to me, that that's where it's really interesting. I mean, in 2012, you know, how did you help Uber slash why did they come to you and talk, talk about how you helped like these different startups where, where your expertise, you know, what, what did you do with them? Sure. So in the case of Uber, I think uh, humbly, I was just lucky to, to join on board and, and be an investor um, in the past. Um, you know, in, in some of the other instances, for example, I work with companies like uh, I'd mentioned Hinge. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Justin when he was early on in DC and then moving to New York. And we dealt with everything ranging from like, hey, what's the product going to be looking like? What's the strategy? How are you going to position it relative to Tinder? Um, and, and really tactical issues. I think oftentimes founders find themselves stuck. I found myself stuck to this day. It's still problematic around people because a company really doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a company. It's just a collection of people that are jamming and trying to realize a vision. And sometimes you lose sight of that when you're in Excel or you're looking at these things. And I've spent a lot of my time mostly talking about those types of things. Like I have a co-founder or what do we do about this? And how do you metric people? For startups, you know, things that you want other people to build and that you want to support? Oh man, I have so many things. Um, I think there's a lot of spaces that are interesting. The one that's the most interesting to me that's Greenfield um, is um, VR as a channel. And so when I look at it, so you have web, which was really disruptive to all the offline. Then you had mobile, which was disruptive to web. And now you have, for the first time, a new channel potentially in VR. And I'll, I'll bucket AR into it. I think that people are grossly overestimating the impact of that in the next two years, but they really don't understand how big it's going to be in the next five to 10. And I think it's going to be unbelievably significant. I mean, you can have multiple billion dollar plays ranging from you know, new ad networks to you know, God knows, maybe someone figures out a new Amazon or even a new Google or Facebook. So. I'm super excited about that as a new space because um, there could be a million opportunities in that. But you know, looking at web services and everything like that, looking at massive problems. So for example, in fintech, there's a number of categories that can be disrupted, like big markets, things that you don't even know about, $800 billion markets, and the competitors are, are pretty slow, right? It's kind of the Nest thesis, right? Nest went after what they were doing because Honeywell was their biggest competition. And in the VR space, is there anything that you've seen that's really excited you? Have you started working with any VR companies? Or I haven't had the opportunity to work with any. I've seen a lot of things that have excited me. And I think what's really challenging and interesting about the space right now is timing. So uh, a lot of the best people are. It's, it's in the early stages where it's very like tech developer oriented. Like A lot like when Web 2.0 came out, everyone was a hacker, a coder, and you know, there was a lot of that ethos in there. Even if you look at Twitter as a network, a lot of the initial people were tech geeks, right? And that's not how Snapchat started, for example, right? It's just the, the channel was not mature enough. And I think VR is there. I haven't seen anything yet other than the platforms. Like, clearly Oculus is, is pretty sick. Um, I've heard amazing things about Magic Leap as a platform. But in terms of the actual services within the platforms, I haven't... I don't think we, anyone has really seen anything that's popped because people are just starting, right? There's a lot of these like niche communities around um, different products, but it's so early, man. Um, I'd love to see it. Model <clears throat> has been critiqued for years for either, you know, some people say it just doesn't work or some people say that you find one startup that does work like Twitter and then the studio is dead. Um, what are your thoughts about that when you were approached to, to be a part? So I think... When you look at a studio in abstract, um, at the end of the day, it's just a platform for founders to build companies, whether it's in labs for us where it's third parties, right, um, and people that we just want to support because we get to know them, um, or whether it's our own companies. Um, there's just different ways to make it work. So one um, 
you know, group like Ali uh, Corp out, like Kevin Ryan's group, they built Guilt. Um, they built a bunch of different stuff, Mongo. And so they're pretty quiet. And uh, there's another one, Atomic, Jack Abraham. He's done like some great work there as well. So I think there's, it's really about the implementation of it and the people. Uh, what probably we believe that is more successful is just focus and doing less. And each partner is going to do it differently. So for example, like what a partner may try two or three concepts and fail. And we're okay with failing. We have to fail. It's the name of the game we got into, right? Um, but and maybe they decide one of them takes off. If that one thing carries everything they've done, like no one would argue that medium, for example, uh, right now wasn't a good outcome out of obvious or you know those types of things. And so I think each person has to make it work for themselves. I think where it doesn't work is if you just shotgun a million things, don't focus. Um, so I don't have the answer yet on like, I don't think there's a way to say, is studio right or wrong? It's just, hey, can you, does it make sense for like us to use a platform versus starting it on our own and, you know, doing all these other things? Yeah, I think, I think that definitely makes sense to me. Facebook brand, uh, you know, Atomic, for example, some of these you mentioned were a bit more quiet, maybe Betaworks is a bit, you know, more public. How do you guys view Expo as a brand and its growth? I think our partners, uh, when we look at Expo as a brand, we focus on builders. So I think the thing you'll find common in the DNA of everyone is that, again, I use that word craftsman, but everyone uh, is product oriented, everyone's operational, everyone's technical. People have founded companies, you know, if not sold companies, built you know massive value uh, within those companies. And, uh, you know, we're realists, right? We're, we're not out there every day talking to folks. We're not at every conference. We're here building. We do things like this because you guys are a community of builders that we would love to talk to and potentially work with through labs or whatever. And so I don't know if loud or quiet represent us. I mean, we'll, we'll be out there when people need us and, you know, we're going to try our best to help the folks that we're working with, but we're really just focused on building amazing companies. Travis, but Travis is the one that's a lot more, you know, a lot more people know who Travis is and, and sort of have a story around Travis. Tell us a bit more about what makes Garrett so great. All of us are always unearthing new superpowers. So I think uh, Garrett is a person that he really realizes his strengths and weaknesses. Um, he's amazing at product. I mean, he really has a sense for you know what's going to work and he has a patience right i think there's this so you look at uber for example and uber was in my mind and when you know talk to garrett he often reinforces this uber was an inspiration for expa so garrett started uber as a side project because he just wanted to see it in the world there was about two years of work before uber became what we know you know it started to kind of pick up where it was very quiet i mean garrett put in some initial money and then, uh, you know, he hired the cars, he's driving around the back with like checklists, making sure things work. I mean, getting all the jankiness out of an app. That's like, there's a behind the scenes in founding a company where it's very early. And he just has this amazing patience, perseverance, and will, um, coupled with a really great product sense. And I, I mean, not speaking for him or any of my other partners, but I think he has this humility and he understands, hey, there's some things that I should be stepping up and leading whether it's functional or even the company. And sometimes there's times where I can partner in the case of Uber clearly made a great decision in um, saying, Hey, Travis, come on board. And I think when I hear him talk about, it, I mean, early on it was just him and then Graves came on and Travis was advising and moved over to um, get more involved and become a partner. Now he's the great leader that everyone's invested in and believes in, but there had to be someone at the very, very beginning who was just sitting there grinding uh, when it was really lonely and uh, Garrett's good at that. said it was a niche thing for rich people what were your thoughts oh when i did i think i think so i think i caught that train pretty late i mean when i looked at uber and you know i've some things like for example there's a company that i back called convoy which is you know people often call it the uber for trucking but it's more it, it's a marketplace connecting the 1.2 million owner operators of trucks to all of these different shippers and it's an 800 billion dollar industry right it's very like in the US alone, it's trillions worldwide. And so when you look at these things, sometimes you catch them early, sometimes uh, you don't, right? And so part of my life is just, I'm very lucky to be able to 
either invest or advise some of these things because you can't build everything, right? But it's really fun to to be around for part of those rides and, and invest in things that can inspire you or you want to see in the world. Foursquare, uh, but Naveen has been there from the beginning too. What makes Naveen so great? What's what's I think uh, Naveen actually has a lot of the same great qualities that Garrett has. Uh, he's very product focused. He's very, very much a brand curator. And I think some of the things that Naveen also has that make him exceptional are he's really an excellent human being. Uh, not to say Garrett's not, but where, where that translates into is that um, he cares about the interaction between people so much and he's very good at working on his relationships, his communication, and um, just mo it's motivational. Like you see him work with his teams and they just, it seems like they're really enjoying that relationship. And uh, he really does care about everything he works on from the person up, right? And I think that translates out into the way that he crafts his products and his, uh, his uh, opportunities. It seems that, I mean, you, Expo has a strong presence both in San Francisco and New York. Is that deliberate or Naveen just wanted to live in New York? So I think it was very deliberate in the sense that when you look at some of the epicenters for startup development, New York and San Francisco um, are arguably two of the biggest centers for creativity with respect to startup development. I think what we're seeing now is this um, new movement where startups can go anywhere. And I'm, I'm super excited about that. I'm a native of Pittsburgh. And when I started my company, uh, you know, that was tougher. But I look at some of these new communities and I see so much excellence. So who knows? I mean, my hope is that there's there's things everywhere um, for, you know, Expo can grow. And, and if it's not Expo, then there are other programs because there's so much opportunity to be an entrepreneur. It's so much easier than it ever was before. About building a company or investing just intellectually, something you used to believe you know, pretty strongly that you now over time have uh, changed your mind about or seen as misguided in some way, something where you've evolved your opinions on. I think, so a lot of things to be really intellectually honest. When I started my company, I was out of graduate school. I'd never worked really. Uh, and then I went into this world where there was payrolls and systems and raising money and people and, and all of those other things. So I think one of the things that I learned uh, that maybe not might not be surprising is just the value of process. And I think sometimes when you start a company, there's this tendency to to shun process and like, you know, oh, well, it's all flat and, you know, everyone can just be participating in everything and it's a startup and we're hustling and forget about it. And I think it doesn't work very well. It doesn't scale. So you need to have clear ownership or responsibility because, you know, it's almost like if everyone owns everything, no one owns something. And, you know, if you include everyone on every decision, then they actually can't do their job. So it's about how to balance out creating this environment where you get all of the best ideas from all of these smart people that are going to work on it, keeping the communication as flat as possible, but making sure that everyone can be so awesome at what their job is. And I don't think that, at least for me, I really understood what that meant and how to implement a system like that until later on. When you do implement a system like that? I think what it looks like, and I'll talk more about feelings, is that everyone feels less anxiety. In other words, they know how they can win. They know how their win contributes to the company's win. And they know how the company's win contributes to the world at large. And they don't feel isolated, right? They feel like empowered by the fact that, okay, if I'm running engineering and I have a great idea around the product, a great idea around the marketing, I can communicate it out. I know it's been registered and I know that it's going to get prioritized in a way that I can actually like see, but I don't have to do it. And I trust that the person next to me is going to kill it. They're going to take my idea and like multiply times 10. And so, to me, it's really about trusting the other folks that you have on your team and making sure that there's like transparency, like, you know, the worst thing are black hole kind of organizations where you just like send suggestions, send suggestions, and like, you don't know where they went. It's like, I talked about this eight months ago. Why is this here now? And so organizations, I think, flip-flop. They do, they do tend to sometimes become a little black hole when things get crazy, but I think you want your average state to be one where people can just, you know, really feel good about that. You were scaling at this. Uh, what were some of the biggest mistakes you made? The biggest mistakes I made? I made a lot. Uh, <laughs> or that so, come to mind uh, that, you could, that are fixable? Or advice you have for people who are scaling? 
So I guess I can speak to, there, there were a lot of things that um, we could have probably done better. I think there were a lot of things that we did well, but I'll just speak for my own personal accountability. I, I, my advice to entrepreneurs based on my experience would be what we did well was we brought in amazing people who were more senior than us to advise us a lot. But I think what I started to lose sight of is like as those people moved to the board and I had, you know, we had amazing people like Ted Leonsis, who is now executive chairman of Groupon and working at Amex and had founded AOL. He was a great mentor, the founder of Capital One. And but creating your own kind of as a as a founder and CEO speaking that specifically, your own coaching system, like someone who's like literally pushing you personally, that's not necessarily on your board or not in the company, because being uh, in that CEO role is a pretty it's lonely. I don't think people quite understand how that feels, right? Um, your board always wants you to go faster. Your management team always feels like you, you know, you might be implementing the wrong thing based on their, you know, function. Uh, and you really don't have as many people to talk to as you would like because you have to compartmentalize a lot of the relationships just for sanity. So I wish that I did a better job of not just only getting great people in the company, but getting great people who are specifically trying to make sure to keep me moving forward, um, that's what I would advise people to do. And there's a lot today, a lot of you know, sort of investors and founders are, are praising the, the role of a CEO coach. Yeah. Uh, besides sort of being a sounding board slash therapist, where is a CEO coach most, is CEO coach also helpful tactically or where are they most helpful? And not to say that that isn't a lot, you know. I think everyone's gonna be different. so. You know, there's a guy, Bill Campbell, in the Valley that everyone talks about. I don't know if you're familiar with the guy, um, but he's a big fan, uh, or everyone's a big fan of what he's done. He comes from a kind of tough love perspective, and he, I'm sure that his sessions are different for, you know, different styles of companies he comes in. I know that he's close with the SV Angel folks, and, uh, you know, even guys who, you know, I was talking to the guy who's the former chairman of Burger King, CEO of J. Crew, he, he references him as a guy that would he would get advice from. And so I think it really is going to depend on who you are and what stage you're at. But again, I would always have someone who's on your side only pushing you and keeping you honest. Um, because what ends up happening, at least realistically, is you'll have those advisors and some of them make their way to the board and then they have an obligation from a board perspective to kind of manage and govern from that vantage. But like sometimes you want to pre-process and be like, hey, is this a crazy idea? Should I take this to my board? Am I doing the right thing? And you can't always talk to people on your board as much as you'd love to and as, as awesome as they are because, you know, uh, they just have a job to do, right? Yeah. In your uh, sort of an Expo's, you know, Expo's ideal world comes to, comes to play, what does Expo look like in five years? What have you guys I think we talk about that a lot actually, and we just had a partner meeting where we were discussing a lot about the future even in the next year. And I think for us, we are looking at, we want people to look back and say, Expa is a builder of companies. The companies that they built, um, you know, not every single one of them might have been a home run, but the ones that really work were exceptional. And the founders that we worked with through Expa Labs had an exceptional experience. So for us, it's really, it's not about having a million companies. It's about having a couple really, really large, you know, successes that we didn't just contribute to. Um, we contributed to the success of the team, if that makes sense. Here's why Expo took in Drip. Uh, it seems that Operator Reserve are sort of different types of companies than, than Drip is. Talk more. So operator and reserve were uh, more studio uh, companies. So our core model that we started with, I think what we've done and what I most product people do is experiment quite a bit because we all had an interest in understanding how can we have more impact and help build more companies. We've asked ourselves the question, do we, do we want to become investors or do we do something like we did end up launching, which was a labs, which is more of a partner to them of these founders and actually provide not just capital, but real estate, financial help, like whatever we can do, like more of a incubation style platform. And so I think Drip started off really simply. We, we wanted to learn. We uh, thought highly of the founders and I know Naveen and Garrett were the, were the two that kind of championed that. Um, I was lucky to get to meet the founders 
after the fact and some of the team and, and work with them after that. But I think they were just saying, hey, we're excited about these this team and their mission and their vision. And we just wanted to help them out and, and learn how that would be to have that kind of engagement. And I look at other expert companies like Spot and Mix. Uh, does each one have its own sort of CEO or your own point person? And how, are you, how do you sort of evaluate when to kill something versus when to double? So on the CEO and point person, every single expert company has a lead, whether it's the partner, um, whether it's kind of a GM or whether it's a CEO, and it really depends on the project and the type of opportunity. So, you know, you you know this better than anyone else because you, you're live sitting there on product hunt. How many products do you see? Some of these things just need a smart group of people um, and they just need to hack at it. So getting in a CEO at that stage might not make sense because really it's about product market fit. Um, some of the companies do, do need help uh, early on. And sometimes we have an opportunity, like again, in the operator's case with Robin, um, there was an experienced founder who was excited to work with Garrett on a new project. And so what varies case by case is not that we don't have leaders. We always have a leader on every project. What varies is who the leader is depending on the stage. I would say when a company gets larger, um, you know, in the case of uh, a reserve or an operator and they're out there and they're kind of independent, then yeah, they most definitely have to have CEOs. Uh, I think early on it's more opportunistic and, uh, and that type of thing. Um, in terms of your second question, you asked me about killing things. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of killing things, I think that's the hardest question you can ask any entrepreneur. I don't think anyone has a formula, and if you do, I would love to have it. Um, but I, I think you just, I think you gotta, you gotta set, the way that I look at it, and I'm more data driven maybe because of my background, is what was the thesis that you were trying to prove at the outset uh, of funding the initial project, and then where are you against that thesis, right? So if you're saying, hey, I'm gonna build, I don't know, like a crazy social platform or something like that, and you know, the first bet was, hey, can I get a team together, and can we build like an initial application, we're just putting a little bit of money to see if that team can do anything, and then they satisfy that thesis, well then, okay, great, then we can continue. Um, you may say for that same team, hey, your next goal is to get a million people on this. Now, if they get a hundred people on it after that second phase, then you kind of, you know where you're at and then you have a criteria. So I think part of deciding when to kill something is doing the homework. The a hard part again is to say, what are we trying to prove here? What, what success guys? With, let's see, there, you know, 10 expert companies, I assume not all of them are absolutely blowing up. How do you sort of internally think about, you know, do you think that, do you give it six months? Do you give it a certain time period? Do you, is it, when, when do you sort of say to yourself, hey, this isn't working relative to the hypothesis that we presented? I personally make it more um, data driven, whether it's like some binary thing or it's like, hey, we haven't hit certain metrics. Um, you like to do it. Now, sometimes you have these, the best things in the world are clear failures. I don't mind clear failures. Those are the best. They're so easy, right? Like um, team explodes or, um, product just stinks or whatever, or like people just don't like it. Those are easy decisions. And I, and I think people welcome those types of things when you're, when you're doing a lot of experimentation, clear growth is an easy one. I think where the hard part is, is in that gray, it's kind of growing or it's kind and I think you have to make a judgment call about what side of it it's on. So in the example of like a consumer facing app, maybe you killed the engagement equation, but your growth isn't there. And then you have to make a tough call and say, is it, the growth loops or is it the product and then you have to implement a little bit of judgment but i i would really you know i'd start with the first principles i understand what you want to achieve and then you can kind of navigate the gray area with those in mind i'm curious when you think of the term success in the way that success means to you who, who comes to mind as sort of a strong you know role model or someone you admire in terms of success the people that i admire the most um, right now, I mean, are the people that just keep going at it after they've hit it out of the park. So, um, you know, some of the mentors that I mentioned that I had, you know, I look at Ted Leonsis as an example, the guy, you know, founded AOL, set up the internet revolution, but he's continuing to, to develop himself and his, uh, the, his value add to the world. You know, he bought the caps and he's creating a media network around it called Monumental. He ended up going to Groupon and being a vice chairman. He started Revolution with Steve and started investing to help other founders. He doesn't need to work, you know, uh, but he's committed to work for work's sake. And he does it in a way that 
you know, if you asked his his son, who's a great guy, Zach, uh, what he thought of his dad, I think he would say, my dad's my hero. And not because of his accomplishments, but because his character and the way he treats people is unbelievable. So I think it's about just wanting to fight to fight and keeping sure you keep your priorities and that people that you work with and have in your life just, they say, man, this is a person that I just respect. You are evaluating founders for Expa, uh, you know, for this incubator, for example. What are you most looking for? Or how are you, uh, you know, what do you most look for? It's your litmus tests or just in general? So I think when we look at um, founders and, you know, for Expa Labs in particular, uh, there's going to be all of us. So I, I'm, you know, I'm curious to see how all of my partners are going to do this. We haven't even run version one of this. Um, actually, Eric, can we hold on for one second? Take a quick pause. Give me sure, one second. Sure. Technical difficulties. Hold on. Don't worry. I have an editor for this podcast too. No, it's all good. Sorry, guys. Perfect. Uh, my power. I didn't realize my power outlet died uh, before some <laughs> moving ship. No All right, guys, welcome to the other side of the Expo office. Nice to see you. All right, we're good. All right. I remember what my question was. Do you remember it? Oh, how do we evaluate founders? Okay, so um, I think everyone's going to do a slightly different lens, but for my part, I think the way that I look at founders is pretty simple. So, and, and Garrett actually uses these three, these three psychological profile things, which I think are great, and how he evaluated Travis uh, at Uber as a partner for himself, and how Uber I think thinks about things, um, at least based on his opinion: intelligence, creativity, and hustle. So when I look at a founder, it's like, are they off the charts smart? Um, are they creative? So if they face some roadblock, are they going to come up with some innovative solution? And are they going to work hard? So you know, I'll give you an example of um, one founder that I really, really admire. And, and investing in him was very like a no-brainer. So the founder of Washio, a guy named Jordan um, Metzner, he's an amazing guy. I mean, this guy came in and him and his co-founder, when we invested in Washio and did um, the very, very first seed before they had anything um, product wise, the guy coded up his own app, put it up on Heroku. Him and his co founder were folding and washing laundry. They were driving it themselves. They did the Facebook campaigns and they literally came back and showed us the unit economic model, the, the, the whole thing. I mean, these two guys did everything and, and they didn't even know how to do it. They're not technologists, they're just smart guys. And I looked the guy in the eye and I knew he was going to do it no matter what. And if we didn't invest, someone else, he was, he's going to make it happen. And so he had this just underlying fire. And so that's kind of what I look at. The founders of Sweetgreen are very similar. You know, uh, John Neiman and his team are just unreal. I walked in their office, it was Friday night at eight, and they, they were just hustling, working, 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 working. And you just sense this energy and this sense of purpose that is very, it's beyond you, you know? The investment isn't the goal. You're just like something they're collecting right. along the way. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. How did you meet the Sweet Green guys originally? So the Sweet Green guys uh, were in DC, which is where I was living at the time, and they'd started out as just you know a, a local uh, seasonal kitchen. And what they've done is actually, I mean, unbelievably phenomenal. I mean, it's a massive, massively fast-growing company. They've built an amazing brand. They have a festival that has twenty thousand people that go and headliners like Calvin Harris. So. Talk about guys that have hustle. I mean, they just work and work. And they started that out of Georgetown um, and just built it from the ground up with their own hands. So I think they, they are guys that I also go in that criteria, right? Uh, Garrett or Travis originally for the Uber thing? So Garrett and I have known each other for a while, actually. So it's funny. We always try to debug how it, when was the first time we met. So there's a couple different uh, avenues. One, when I was at Add This and... So add this has uh, tools that make it easy to grow your website, right? And the way that we do that, the first tool was this sharing plugin, right? So we could share to different social networks. So obviously I would go around going to every single social site and Garrett happened to be CEO of StumbleUpon. And so I met him and the team and actually one of my other partners, Roberto, was at StumbleUpon at the time. And so 
that's how I think we met from a business perspective. And then, you know, we'd known each other socially and just hung out. It's, it's just a small community. When the web started coming back and social was kind of the wave, everyone kind of knew each other. So when I decided to move to San Francisco, he was a guy that I always thought was super chill, very low key, and just uh, a guy I respected that I wanted to call and see if he, you know, what he was up to and, and compare notes. From a product perspective and just in terms of product shops, product insights, uh, what are you most looking for? Or what are sort of your limits test for how you evaluate? For product people specifically? So it's very similar to the founding side. So product in some sense is a little bit cross-function because you have to understand not only how you build the product and be able to work with um, you know, great devs and engineers, right, to like realize the vision in a way that makes sense. But you actually have to understand the customer quite a bit. So in my mind, it's like the first cross-functional role, even though they, they think of product as isolated. And there's a lot of different product people. So I just look for people that, one, have like amazing communication abilities. Um, they are able to drive people to consensus, right? Because it's one thing if you're just like a guru and you can like hack together a pixel and work with like a two-person team. Um, it's another thing if you can manage, you know, start to scale out an organization and try to get uh, a group of people to do something amazing. And so I think communication is one. And then the second thing is that they really, really understand the customer to base level. I'm always impressed with people who just like, they can look at a screen and be like, hey, you know, I would... You're, you're scrolling down here and your core action is supposed to be X. And if you have a scrolling interface, they're actually going to get fatigued at this point. So they think about how the features impact the experience, but they can relate it back to kind of like the data and the information and how they're going to like test and change it. So just like they understand the mechanics of consumer behavior at like this like quantum level. I want to ask a bit of broader questions. Uh, do you have any sort of daily or weekly rituals uh, whether work or personal that you swear by? I have a lot. I think one of the big lessons learned from Add This was, uh, you know, a lot of the culture, I think, when Web 2.0 came out was all about this programmer grind, right? Crank out Red Bull, stay up all night, and just like, you know, relish in the people that slept in the office for, for three days. And, um, you know, we all were, we all wanted to do that. And I think we all put in a lot of great work and effort. But I think what I realized, if you want to build a lasting company, entrepreneurs are like athletes. And athletes take care of their bodies because their bodies house their minds. And so I have gotten greater efficiency by really paying attention to the basic thing, which is I have to be super healthy. So, you know, I'm pretty religious about what I eat. And, you know, I wake up in the morning really early and I make sure I either work out, play guitar, and every day I meditate for uh, a bit just to clear my head out. So it's really made a difference in my life, my performance, and everything else as an entrepreneur to just take care of myself. Were you in a band growing up? I played a lot of music. So I play guitar uh, and everything else. I am sad to say that I never actually got to play in a band. Um, I had some great uh, folks who worked at this. A guy actually now who's CTO of Ondo, uh, which is our new company. He plays like five instruments. He's been in the band. Uh, I had another buddy, Charlie, who now is at Oracle. We had this, who's also, they got to play in a band. I never followed their footsteps. I should have. Tell me, if, if Expo never came around is, is the opportunity, after I had this, I mean, I knew you were investing through your own vehicle, but what did you sort of see as your long-term, did you think you were going to start another company again? Did you think you were going to double down on the investing? Did you ever consider being a VC partner? Like, how did you, you know, evaluate your career then? So I have a pretty simple philosophy on life. I gravitate towards things I love, and I try to learn quickly what I don't like, and I move away from it. And what I found early on in my trajectory is that I love to build things and I like to make stuff. My mind is always racing with ideas. And I think any entrepreneur that you talk to can tell you five ideas they have in five other spaces that they could or would do at any given time. And I think for me, my platform, my world is how do I let like, how do I just work with as many people as I can at scale? And so on one hand, I'm, if, I, if I can't build it, you know, I get a small piece of joy out of being able to invest and maybe spend some time advising. Um, I have, if I have enough energy and time and I think I'm the right person, then I'm going to actually build it. And then, you know, in the case of that, you know, like an add this or maybe whatever that's going to be next, if I think I'm the best person in the world, then I'll just spend a ton of my time building. So 
all my my next you know couple of years is always just going to be around how do I how do I inject creativity into the world? And you know, I was an artist. I drew and I play guitar. There's all these mediums by which you can shape the world. But being an entrepreneur is the best one, in my opinion, because the thing you build a pro, a company is something amazing. It's like it's like art that creates art forever. Like I'm gone from Add This for how many years, and it's on millions of sites. And there's a bunch of people who are so much smarter than me who are continuing to innovate and create new products. I'm gone, right? I'm not even there. And it's just continuing. Mm -hmm. So it's just like this thing that if you can build companies, I mean, look at AOL. It's, it's, it's not where it was, but all of us are here because of it. All, we're talking right now on this thing because of AOL. And so it's just amazing privilege, I think. And I, I just want to keep being around it as long as I'm allowed to. Firm as a partner or scaling a company that's already pretty big? Um, or did you want to be early? I, I'm always, you know, open to every learning experience that's around building. And so, yeah, I, I now that I'm like, I guess older, <laughs> I don't know. I never thought of it when I moved to the Valley. I did get an opportunity to speak to a lot of really amazing growth companies about leadership roles. And uh, I also spoke to some um, VCs about joining and just doing full-time investing. And I think at this stage right now, where I'm really excited is just to stay early and Expo is a model and a platform that lets me have the joy of building, you know, free of the studio and then, you know, continue to invest and advise either via labs or even personally. So I get to have my cake and eat it too here. And I think I want to stick around for a while. Staff to life on the East Coast. So I was just in New York and uh, I was talking to a really great uh, friend who is uh, one of the partners at ENIAC, which is a VC over on there. They're focused on mobile in the hall. And he actually comes back and forth and we were talking about this and like New York City, for example, is one of the greatest cities in the world. I love going there. But when I come to San Francisco, what's amazing about it is the sustainability, right? And there's this focus on creativity and building great companies, but I also am allowed to be alive. So New York, you will schedule dinner at 10 o'clock and then you'll get a drink with someone in a meeting at 1130 and you're up till two and you wake up at six again. And so it's the culture. And of course, you don't have to participate. You can live the life you live out there. But there's something awesome about San Francisco, which is like pure, where if you want to just build and then also like have this quality of life, you're allowed to do it. And it's, it's the culture. What? Yeah. So I, I was conceived in Iran, born in London, raised gotcha. in Pittsburgh. I'm uh, definitely unique. <laughs> yeah. Did, uh, do you guys, do you have an interest in international startups? Like just slash, have you invested in any or do you think you will? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I actually was just taught, there's a lot of great programs around this. So I know the 500 guys are doing some great work around this. Um, um, I have a friend, uh, a guy named Selchik Hatley, who started uh, Nomadic Mentors, which is a program where entrepreneurs here can actually go overseas, whether it's to Turkey or London or whatever, and help advise them. And so I'm just dipping my toes in that. Um, you know, like McClure and, and the 500 crew are, I think, the pioneers in really pushing the envelope on that. And I think you're going to see more of it. Um, so I definitely have an interest. I, I'll admit, though, I'm, I'm a rookie uh, on that. Founders who are applying to Expo in terms of how to make their application, you know, the most strongest. My advice is be simple and, and be bold. You know, um, I wouldn't try to do something that is going to make your application great for us. I would try to be as true to what you're trying to build as, as direct as you can and, and help us understand why you're there, why you're going for this idea. And, you know, just to be clear for Expo Labs, I mean, we're really founder first at this point and not just because that's easy to say, but we're going at the earliest stage, right? It's, it's a first check. Uh, it's a first meeting and we, we want to be there. So, you know, we'd love to better understand the teams and, and why they're so inspired about this, this thing. And as much as we want to understand the company. So I just would say, be as true to yourself as you can and, and, you know, give us a shot at getting to know you via that application. What's it like been working with Hyperloop? Hyperloop is, in my opinion, a moonshot project that's amazing. And Shervin, who's a close friend of all of ours, um, in fact, from me, from the DC days, he was at Webb's uh, first. That's just how I met him uh, in DC. And uh, 
you know, we're uh, at Expo very lucky to be a part of that. All, a lot of us individually have invested. And um, I think what they're doing is unbelievable. And I think it's going to take a ton of capital. And I think it's going to be one of these things that, you know, we won't know the realization of that vision for years. Um, but, you know, gosh, man, if that thing works, it'll be unbelievable. It's going to change the world. It's literally going to change the world. And there's only a few things, a few companies that can really, really do that in the way that they would do that. You know, look at SpaceX, for example. And I think there's this tier of companies that are going for something so bold, so crazy that, you know, I mean, can you imagine raising, having to raise hundreds of millions of dollars before you, you get a check? It, it's just yeah. take some balls. And uh, so I really admire what they're doing there and, and we're excited to be a part of it. What makes Shervin so great? Like, what is he best? So, you know, I've gotten to know him for, gosh, I don't even know how long it's been, maybe 10 years. And uh, I think what Shervin superpower is, is he is just, he's so, he has such a broad vision about the world and he just wants so much change to occur. And he's so good at meeting and connecting with those change makers. I mean, Shervin has become one, he's like, you know, he used to be Shervin Pichu Bar and now it's just Shervin, right? And it's like Madonna. And uh, so people know him, people know his passion, and he's, he's very loud about it. And he doesn't, he doesn't waver from uh, his desire to, to work with people that want to change the world and, and to do it. And he's very bold in that. So he's done a great job in building this like amazing network. I mean, it's unbelievable. I'll go to LA, I'll go to New York, I can go to London, and I can say his name in circles. And literally, someone just like, oh, I just had dinner with him. Or um, it, it's an amazing strength. Lots of work. Lots of work. Yeah. yeah. He um is something that he really understands about relationships that sort of just transcends uh you know industries and different types of people. I think in the in the business that Shervin is in, which is venture capital, a lot of the success of venture capital, it's 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 a two part equation, right? One is deal flow, and then the other is picking the right deal, right? If you want to take the mechanic of venture capital and boil it down to two skills that they have to have, and what Shervin does well is the top of the funnel if you're going to use marketing language, right? He's unbelievable at just like getting out there and knowing what's happening, uh, knowing the founders that are doing it. So he, he's great at engineering that. And, um, you know, he's positioned his firm at Sherpa um, in a very interesting way, right? Like, because every, if you're an entrepreneur, you can go to a lot of VCs. Like, how are you going to, everyone has to be different. You have to have like a, a, I don't know, founder VC fit, if you will. It's like the analogy to product market fit. And so he's positioned them in a very bold way that I think is going to attract a certain type of entrepreneur. I have not had an opportunity to, but you know, he's probably on here and watching it. So we'll, we'll talk later. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, what's a, you know, with the last couple of minutes remaining, I want to sort of say a space and I want you to say whether you, you think it's overrated or underrated or, excited about it, not as excited about it, or, and what's exciting you about that space? Uh, first, uh, you mentioned VR, uh, drone. Uh, I am excited about it. So I don't know, I guess I would say it's normal rated. Normal. Yeah. I don't think it's overrated. Yeah, yeah. How about, uh, Bitcoin? Are you long or short Bitcoin? I am long on Bitcoin as a protocol. Um, and I think Bitcoin is a currency. I'm indifferent. I could care less. Uh, I think the fact that, you know, it's such a fundamental potential protocol. I mean, you could have no banks. You could have the, the potential of it is clear. Uh, I think what's missing right now is the, the initial innovation has just been around it as a currency. Uh, and that's not to say that people like Coinbase and others aren't thinking bigger, but the initial companies, if you look at it, are around as a currency. I think the blockchain and the protocol and just like, this idea of taking out a middleman with a protocol is unbelievable. So in the next 10 years, I'm, I'm very long on it. Uh, biotech. Biotech, I like specifically on bioinformatics. So if you look at the reality right now, we have, you know, by 2020, we're going to have everyone with a, a mobile phone, which is going to be, you know, way more powerful than what the president of the United States, you know, 10 years ago had at his disposal for like his entire arsenal of information, right? So everyone's going to have the power of the internet in their hand. And so when I look at the phone, you can change diagnostics. You can have, you know, imagine in Africa, like 
that tricorder vision of Star Trek, right? Someone like pops in something to an iPhone or there's new devices and you could do all kinds of things with ultrasound. So I think to the degree that technology can be applied to kind of democratize healthcare and like take out hundreds of thousands of dollars machinery and boil it down to a phone or, you know, make it so the doctors come to you. There's just so much opportunity there. Um, I don't know enough about like the drug discovery process and all those things to speak to it with confidence, but I'm excited about that kind of bioinformatics and um, technology as it relates to devices. How about artificial intelligence? I'm going to be contrarian and say it's overrated um, because honest to God, uh, I, I think people misuse the term and, you know, coming from Carnegie Mellon and like a, a kind of more computer science background, you know, I think the applications, when you look at the sub so like voice recognition or machine learning and all of those other things, I am bullish on. When you look at artificial intelligence, it's like this general class of, like, I see all these pitches and people are always like, I'm AI for this, I'm AI for that. Um, like, you're not AI for anything, right? Like, Google is working very hard on Facebook, but you need a massive data set, you need a lot of computing. Um, it's, it's a non-trivial problem, but the sub-applications, like whether it's machine learning and everything else, I think they're going to... I mean, you're seeing it. It's going to happen. What's the a field that I didn't mention that you think is sort of underrated that you think is going to be huge? And you know, you already said VR, but people are talking about VR. What's something that you think people aren't aren't talking about as much? I feel that people aren't talking about as much. I think um, I think right now, I think what people aren't talking about as much or doing as much of is taking. Um, existing industries that are really boring and really big and basically uh, disrupting them via either software or technology. I think there's been talk of it, but I think it's not like this like big persistent theme like, you know, look at Nest. I mean, look at these other things that, that came out. That to me is thematically like whether you go down, you know, fintech routes or whether you go down trucking, um, taking the boring business, like the really ones that like, it's hard. They're like really hard businesses and just winning them over. I, I hear it, but I, it's not like a super trend because it's not as easy to point to and be like, you know, oh my God, this is going to change the world, this and the other. But, um, you know, I think one thing that's interesting just thematically, and I, I guess it's not a technology, but I'll just leave you with a note, which we have to have a challenge on. I think automation, like the social challenge of automation is something that there'll be cool investment opportunities, but policy wise. So for example, Self-driving cars are real. Everyone's seen them and who's in the valley, right? And in a couple of years, they're going to be driving around. There are millions of people whose jobs depend on driving, right? So you have millions of people who are driving taxis and cabs. You have millions of people who are driving trucks. You have millions of people who are driving planes, right? So imagine that all those jobs are destroyed, right? Now imagine that same technology is used in the factories to take down what used to be 40 workers down to five. And so opportunity for us as entrepreneurs is like, where do those people go? What can they do next? Do we shift to a service industry? Are people gonna be, are there gonna be more personal trainers? Are there gonna be more nurses? Because all of the automation is gonna take out manufacturing and what have you. Um, so looking at trying to transform what could be a train wreck into an opportunity might not, might be another like non-obvious thing. And what are your, your hunches there in terms of what those people could be doing? My bet is that we're gonna have an insanely large service economy. Right. So a lot more people who are coaches, nutritionists, psychiatrists, um, helping people with things that are soft, that people can only help people because, you know, you can't go into. So, for example, in the car industry, my prediction would be like you'll see consolidation, like crazy stuff like Uber buys a car company or Google buys a car company and then it moves from a B to C market to B to B. So a lot of these people, when they get retrained and they're going to go into things you know, what if they were like moving into, like people still need to be healthy, people still need to be well. So I think a lot of the industry will be around how do we make people have better lives, right? Wellness, health, you know, things that you ha that a machine, at least for the near term, can't touch as much, right? Higher level, like parts of being a physician. Would you be fascinated in a marketplace for sort of health and wellness related coaching or? I'm in yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of stuff around that. I think there's going to be a lot around wellness. And in particular, when you look at um, video, like what we're doing right now, you know, how much of health and wellness has to occur on site versus, you know, virtually. I think there's going to be huge right. opportunities in that. Right. Cool. Well, Human, I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you for coming on the Product and Podcast. It's fascinating. The expo 
you know, application has just been released. Uh, any last minute plugs for you or Expo or what we can expect to see going forward for, for audiences? Yeah, guys, um, anyone who's on or anyone who has friends, please, if uh, you know you have an idea, a great team, would love for you guys to apply expo.com backslash labs. Um, we're excited to meet you, to review um, those things. We're only going to start with six people, but you know we're excited to get to know everyone. We hope to grow the program, and uh, you know, we'll, you ho we'll hope you think about working with us. And uh, I love Product Hunt. Use it. Perfect. Thank you, Uman. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and I will talk to you soon. All right, Eric. Thanks a lot, man. Take care. Yeah, take it easy. Uh, perfect. Thank you, everybody. Uh, guys, give a big shout out on Twitter to Human uh, Radfar. It is at H O O M A N R A D F A R. Uh, fantastic guy, one of the most respected builders. Uh, in the Valley right now, and Expo is doing some really great things. So make sure you tweet him, let him know you enjoyed this episode, uh, apply for Expo because they're doing some great things, and uh, check out their other companies too uh, at expo.com. Uh, cool. Thank you guys for checking out another episode of Product Hunt Live. Tweet at me or Product Hunt if you have any feedback, and I will see you next time. Have a great day, everybody.